myself started and respect for everyone's time. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Kate Frankfurt, and I am the Chief Philanthropy Officer for the Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation. And on behalf of our CEO, Stacy Caldwell, I wanna thank you for joining the first salon of the season, Forestry Workforce Development Challenges and Opportunities. The Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation has been serving our community since 1998. We connect people and opportunities. We generate resources to build a more caring, creative, and effective community. And while we are attracting philanthropic resources is, is one of the primary areas of focus, without consistent strategy and leadership, money would not go anywhere. We pride ourselves in connecting donors to causes they love, to supporting nonprofits through grants and training, and connecting community leaders to collaborate on strategy. This ensures that our grant making and the resources we attract to our region are aligned and effective. We have with us tonight our CEO, Stacy Caldwell, and we are supported by an amazing board of directors passionate about this region and representing a range of industries and all deeply embedded and deeply engaged in our community. And we have a growing number of TTCF staff, some of which are uh, some of whom are which are with us tonight: Sashay Cantu, Tamia Grisset, Nicole, who is our moderator for the evening, um, and Graham, who's a new staff member. So thank you all for taking time out of your days to join us as well. Community foundations are philanthropic organizations dedicated to improving the lives and the environment of a particular area and they play a key role in identifying and addressing the needs of their region and responding with resources and solutions. Beyond grant making and scholarships, much of which we are known for, TTCF has also identified three critical issues unique to our community and to which we give special attention. Family strengthening, workforce housing, and forest health. Each of these initiatives is supported by a group of stakeholders who work together to advise and collectively tackle the challenges that we face as a community. Challenges that require more than just one agency or one grant to solve. Over nearly 25 years, we are proud to have developed not only trusted relationships, but capacity in this region. And now to our forests. I know we've all been celebrating the past few days of beautiful rain and even a little snow. And while we enjoy blue skies today, this summer has once again brought devastating wildfire with a mosquito fire burning nearly 77,000 acres and sending dense smoke to the area. We are grateful to our firefighters, some of whom are with us today in this salon and who have worked tirelessly to achieve a 60% containment as of today. As partners in this effort, we know that as a community, we must continue to do all that we can to mitigate the risks, to do our part, because it's not if, but when wildfire will finally reach us. So born after four years of deep learning alongside some of the foremost experts in the field, Forest Futures was born as a newest initiative of the Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation. It's entrepreneurial and a strategic model for how community foundations across the country can take a lead role in confronting the local impacts of climate change. There are three areas of impact, protect communities, which is reducing fuels, establishing fire breaks, making sure key evacuation routes are clear and supporting the development and use of technology to keep us informed. Second, to build a forest economy, funding for workforce development, infrastructure, and industry to utilize hazardous forest waste while strengthening the economy in our region, which we're gonna hear more about tonight. And finally, accelerating market solutions, scaling and speeding forest management while creating a model that can be replicated in other global mountain communities. We're deploying flexible and nimble capital to fill needs and gaps and accelerate projects, permits, and progress. And those funds are flowing into the community almost as quickly as we can raise them. We are proud to have raised nearly $5.4 million to date 
and to have released $2 million into the community for critical fuels reduction projects and support for workforce development programs as we protect our community and build a forest economy from the region. And without further delay, I wanna introduce Nicole Lutkenmuller, who's our Forest Futures Program Director, who will moderate our discussion tonight and who will introduce our speakers. Thanks, Kate, and thanks to everyone for joining tonight. Um, we have a great group of speakers tonight who are going to be addressing our forestry workforce development um, challenges and emerging opportunities. And I'd like to introduce all three of our speakers before they jump in. Um, and also would like to ask everyone that um, if you have questions during the present during the speakers presentations, um, we ask you to put them into the chat and we will be monitoring the chat and we'll be recording those questions and we'll address all of the questions um, for the speakers after all of them have given their presentations. And then you can continue to ask questions um, at that time as well. So without further delay, first, I'd like to introduce our first speaker will be Jessica Morse. And Jessica is the Deputy Secretary for Forest and Wildland Resilience at the California Natural Resources Agency. She is coordinating California's approach to wildfire resilience, including increasing the pace and scale of forest restoration and vegetation treatment. Um, Jessica was the architect of the governor's 1.5 billion wildfire resilience strategy and developed the Joint Forest Stewardship Plan. Prior, uh, oh, sorry, the strategy between California and the US Forest Service. Prior to joining Governor Newsom's administration, Jessica spent nearly 10 years in national security working for the Defense Department, State Department, and the US Agency for International Development. Um, she and her family still own their original homestead uh, forest land in the Sierra foothills. And Jessica is an outdoor enthusiast and holds a Master of Public Affairs from Princeton and a Bachelor of Arts in Economics from Principal College. Um, in 2014, you might remember when Jessica Morris ran for US Congress in California's fourth congressional district. Um, and we want to thank Jessica specifically for her role in helping us and other partners with the California State Fair forestry workforce development activities um, and displays that were up at the State Fair this year. Our second speaker tonight is going to be Jeffrey Clary. And Jeffrey is the Senior Director of Climate Strategies at the Foundation for California Community Colleges um, and is bridging workforce development, equity, and community at impact and facilitates and, operate, uh, and facilitates and operations to address climate-related challenges facing Californians. Jeff brings many years of experience navigating institutional ecosystems and creating partnerships to build programs and achieve impact. Jeff has served as administrative director for the UC Davis Natural Reserve System, was a Fulbright scholar, and has served as adjunct professor at Consumnes River College. He earned his Bachelor of Science in Biology at the University of Texas, Austin, and his PhD in Ecology at the University of California, Davis. And finally, we'll have Carly Murphy present after Jeffrey and Jessica. And Carly Murphy is the Forestry Education Grant Manager at Lake Tahoe Community College, where she oversees the development and launch of LTCC's new Forestry Education and Job Placement Program. Carly also manages the grants that fund the program and ensures adequate funding is in place to support students and the further development of the program. So before I hand it over to Jessica to kick us off, um, just another reminder to please keep yourself muted and to type your questions into the chat if you have them during these presentations. And without further delay, I would like to hand it over to Jessica. Thank you so much, Nicole. And it's so nice to see everybody. And, um, and just thank you for all the incredible work you guys are doing on uh, wildfire resilience. I think um, Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation has really been leading the way, um, especially in good modeling of investments in, in demonstrating how um, investments in resilience can actually grow rural economies and, um, and develop that rural workforce as well. Um, and so that's what I wanna talk to you guys about today. Um, our wildfire resilience strategy, as many of you guys are familiar with through um, the uh, Forest and Wildfire Resilience Task Force and Action Plan, and, um, and we've got that out the door and rolling. And uh, we kicked off last year with $1.5 billion investment in wildfire resilience across California. 
That investment launched um, over a thousand projects throughout the state already and, um, and is still growing. We got $1.2 billion of that out the door on the ground. Um, and so that's, I don't know how many of you guys have worked with government forever, but um, that's very nimble and fast uh, for how government usually works. We saw some of the fuel reduction projects we put in place already stop fires both last season and this season um, with funding that we was appropriated last year. So it's really um, a remarkable piece. It's an all hands on deck approach. Um, and that strategy invests across three fronts of fire resilience. We invest inside of communities for things like home hardening and defensible space around communities for strategic fuel breaks and across landscapes. Um, so when you get all three of those fronts, you have um, a lot of community protection, like we saw in the Calder fire where uh, the fuel breaks um, dropped that uh, flame length from 150 feet down to 15 feet around Christmas Valley. You saw prescribed burn um, in that Calder fire burn scar um, that was is still green forest. Um, the fire burned right under it um, because of a previous uh, prescribed burn at Caples Burn. And then the defensible space that that community had done um, and that the Tahoe Conservancy had done and clearing out vacant lots um, and thinning them out to more just so they're just forested rather than understory really made a difference in keeping those flames out of neighborhoods. So we invest in projects across those three fronts, but you guys understand that we can't get anywhere unless we actually have the businesses and the workforce to be able to drive that scale of work. And so I wanna spend a little time talking through what resources the state has invested in. And then you're gonna hear from incredible partners who are actually implementing this um, on the ground. So the state um, is, in, is investing both in workforce and business development. Um, and just one other point I should make before I dive into it, that 1.5 we invested last year, the governor just signed the budget this year that includes an additional 1.3 billion. So that's $2.8 billion across three years in California in wildfire resilience and preventative activities alone. So, um, so it's really exciting. And, um, and so, and that includes a whole program around workforce and business development. Um, so around uh, workforce development, it's over, I think upwards of $50 million. Um, and uh, $54 million across those three years um, for workforce development. And that funding is available as grants through CAL FIRE. And, um, and that is coming to places like Shasta College um, and their uh, forestry program and heavy equipment training program. Um, Tahoe, tr I think the Truckee Community College, I think we're gonna hear from, I think you guys are getting a grant uh, or have already gotten a grant from CAL FIRE. Um, that we've got uh, programs like the CHIPS program throughout the Sierra, which partnered with um, eight local tribes to train uh, forestry crews um, to be able to go out and do fuel reduction work is really crucial. Um, in addition to um, funding for uh, those who also open up scholarships then for higher education as well. So on top of those workforce development grants that are really foundational to making sure that you have a trained workforce in place, and that you're expanding that local community capacity to do that training. We're also investing in a direct workforce ourselves. So we expanded the, the forestry core at the Con California Conservation Corps. Um, so you guys are probably familiar with the Tahoe um, Conservation Corps, which is out doing a lot of uh, field breaks. But um, that Conservation Corps Forestry Corps program is really crucial because they are then a year round fuel reduction crew and they're very nimble. Um, and so we're working on expanding them as well. And, um, and so invested now $20 million every year uh, for the Forestry Corps across those three years. So I guess that's 60 million total for them. Um, so you're looking at that sort of workforce foundation is really helpful. And then in addition to those resources, we're also looking at um, business development and then also how the state can be a stabilizer. And then I wanna highlight one gap with workforce housing, which you guys are aware of. Um, and so. The, the business development piece is also really crucial because once you have this workforce trained, they need to go into actual jobs. Um, and so they can certainly get hired by the state, the Forest Service, our um, state partners and, and NGOs, but also getting them to start their own businesses has been a really good boon in this space. So we wanna make sure that once somebody's trained in how to, be, how to do mastication or um, hazard tree removal, um, or we also have prescribed fire collaboratives that they then have the capital to be able to start businesses there. So we have small business grants from Cal Fire if you're gonna start a smaller business, whether it's um, small machine operation or, or wood utilization, um, if you need support sort of getting that business plan going, 
Um, Cal Fire has business development grants. We also have much larger capital loans. Um, so the infrastructure bank, the state I bank, um, opened up the Climate Catalyst Fund, $50 million for low interest loans for any type of business in the wood use sector. So that could be anybody doing fuel reduction, mastication, um, could be somebody wanting to start a mill, somebody with innovative technology trying to do a mass timber operation. Um, this is designed for much larger businesses and um, it is intended to kind of fill the gap that rural banks used to fill. Um, but when they hear forests, commercial banks tend to run. So we wanted to make sure we had a place to stabilize that. Um, the other areas we're investing in in this space are um, making sure that we're actually, because for us on the business side, a huge issue is wood utilization. What do you do? How do we not have a slash pile crisis, right? We saw a fuels treatment in the August complex fire where um, it was had three different sort of time frames on it. One, it had been treated like four years earlier. So the small slash piles had actually decomposed. Um, one had been treated with a prescribed burn after it had been thinned. Um, so there was no sort of fuel on the ground. And then the last one still had small slash piles scattered throughout the forest um, intended to be pile burned, but then the fire came through before that could happen. And so the area where they had decomposition and prescribed burning, healthy burn on the ground. But the area where the slash piles remained um, was a high severity. Well, it, didn't, it didn't crown out. It wasn't a crown fire, so it didn't complicate the fire behavior. But the heat signature was so hot on the ground, it actually burned the trees at their roots. And so the forest still died. And so for us, we're looking at this question of like, how do you get slash, how do you create the business and the workforce to get that woody material off the forest floor and into a destination? Because we can't count on decomposition or necessarily burn windows for big slash piles anymore. And so we need to get it moved out to a destination sooner. And so we've heard the issues that we're hearing are access to capital. So that's where the iBank and the business loans are coming in. Um, We've also heard feedstock supply stability has been, and unpredictability has been a major issue. So even though we know that there's a ton of work going on because we don't own the land, I, we, the state can't just hand somebody a 10 year agreement for you, congratulations, you can get all the slash off this uh, parcel of forest for the next 10 years. Um, the feds can, but we can't. And so what we did is we changed the appropriation length on our dollars to try to stabilize both the business that supply side and the workforce side. So that instead of having our funds expire after two years when you get a grant, our, our, we change the, the legislation so that the funds expire after seven years. And so that means that when you get that grant, you can hire somebody for seven years, making it worth their while to be able to have that equipment um, that they need to be able to do that work. You can also give off seven years of supply agreement off of those grants um, so that you could then have the, the feedstock stability to invest in something like a small mill or, um, I don't know, you'd go, you know, in, on innovation and invest, turn it into jet fuel. Um, but there are lots of um, technologies out there, but we're trying to, as the state, our role is trying to stabilize the market. Um, another thing that just came through in this year's budget is $10 million subsidy for woody biomass transportation. Um, and so moving that off the forest, because that's also been the hurdle we're hearing is people are saying, well, it doesn't really cost out or pencil out to take it to a destination. But if it's killing off the forest by leaving it there, or we're having to dedicate fuel, uh, fire, whole engine crews during a fire to slash piles rather than to homes, um, because we don't want that to complicate the fire behavior, um, it's worth it then to be able to subsidize that cost in advance to have it moved to a destination that is better than open pile burning, better than a wildfire. Um, and the last point I wanna make is that as we're making these investments across workforce development, across the entire spectrum, we're trying to really link that in so that these are um, career pathways so that when you come into the CCC as a fuels crew or you get hired by Cal Fire as a fuels crew, you have a career path to either become um, a burn boss or a registered professional forest or, or start a mastication business, right? That there's career pathways that come with training, funding and opportunity so that they don't have to figure it out on their own. Um, the piece that I think we haven't solved yet and maybe I'll just close with this for the group to really contemplate is the workforce housing. 
um, that uh, that one of the hurdles we're having in this space um, isn't necessarily salary level, it's the housing capacity and to be able to attract workers there. And so I'm really interested in hearing how we can potentially marry that up. Are there opportunities for us to try to leverage those federal rural development dollars um, to have be more concentrated in the forest sector, right? That's your, your federal analog to HUD. And so how do you get, um, and how as we as a state, can we target some of our housing um, resources to be able to marry some of with uh, this business development that needs to happen, to be able to have these sustainable restoration economies um, delivering us a restored ecology. So I'm excited to partner with you guys. I'm excited to hear your ideas. We're trying to make our resources as flexible and nimble as possible so that you guys can be innovative with it. And we're just investing in removing barriers. Um, but I'm open to feedback, innovation, and, um, and excited to hear how it's going on the ground. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, it's really exciting to see all these new funding streams and new initiatives and just really the, the new way that the state is viewing this issue and, and trying to be responsive to what you know practitioners on the ground are seeing. So we really appreciate you joining and we're gonna turn it over to our next two presenters to talk about um, two kind of, I would call almost more implementation programs or, or some of the examples of how this uh, money and new initiatives are being put to use. And um, again, we'll, we'll come back for questions at the end, but for now I'm gonna turn it over to um, Jeffrey Clary with the Foundation for Community Colleges. And let me share your presentation as well. Okay, thank you. Is everyone uh, seeing that? Yes. And let me get into the slideshow mode. Okay. <laughs> okay. I uh, would thank you, Jessica. That was such a great scene setting for all the things that are going on at the big scale. And uh, so, as as Nicole said, I'm going to bring it down one notch and say and look at one one project, but it's a very large project that is just now getting started as of September 1st. So this is very new and I can assure you the last few weeks have been crazy, but it's also exciting. And I could hear the excitement in Jessica's voice and, I, and everyone we're dealing with is just excited to finally be moving on so many of these things. So that, that's really kind of the refreshing thing about all this work is everybody is kind of aligned in goals and getting stuff done. So I'll be talking to, today, to today, you today, not about some state funds, but a federal initiative called the Good Jobs Challenge and our project, which is known as the California Resilient Careers in Forestry. Uh, Nicole, can I advance the slides or do you have to do that? Yeah, thank you. So just a bit of background. I mean, I'm sure most of you are familiar with your local community colleges. The California network of community colleges is kind of special though, because it does have a true statewide geographic and socioeconomic reach. We've got 116 colleges. So that means we're in a lot of places and it's the largest educational network in the United States. Um, and really it provides kind of a conduit into communities that are otherwise hard to, to reach that don't have a lot of local institutions. And um, on top of that, they are the go-to places for career and technical training. So as far as scene setting, community colleges are a great place to start when we're trying to upskill our workforce to be ready to deal with forest vegetation issues. Uh, and then there's the Foundation for California Community Colleges, where I am based. And this is the nonprofit, nonprofit that supports and benefits the community college network. Um, they, they've always, the foundation has always had a, a large workforce development portfolio, as well as some, a bunch of climate projects, mostly kind of community-based, imp, uh, community impact and equity projects. But over the past couple of years, it's become really clear that there are these needs in California that need to be met and we need to be able to mobilize the community colleges to, 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 to rise to that challenge. And so the foundation has, has really been investing in building up this capacity in this space, including bringing me on board and um, establishing a fund so that we can act quickly to, to get at these questions. Uh, and just our, because we have this very large implant across the state, you know, we, there's a lot of different things we can do. Um, you know, just by having better facilities and operations, we can be models for sustainability. We can have direct impact into, into uh, colleges and into the communities through those colleges. But what we're focusing on today is really meeting California's needs through workforce development. 
So the Good Jobs Challenge is, as I said, federal money. It's sponsored by the U.S. Economic Development Administration. The funds for this, $500 million total, are part of the American Rescue Act. Um, so the, the goal of this is to invest in high-quality, locally-led workforce systems to transform America's communities. Um, when you're talking $500 million, you, get, you generate a lot of interest. And so there were over 500 applicants to this pro pro program. Only 32 were funded, two of which were in California, and one of these was our forestry project. So our, our, the grant is $21.5 million. Most of that is going to be going directly out onto the ground to our partners. And the goal of our project is to, through partnerships with industry, educational institutions, and agencies, place at least 1,500 no more people into forest health and fire safety occupations, and to sca scale statewide infrastructure for education and training in these domains. The partners are going to be really familiar to a lot of you. So we've got five community colleges across the North, North Sierra and Cascades, uh, Shasta College, uh, Feather, uh, Feather River, L Lassen, Lake Tahoe, and Reedley. Uh, in addition to CS CSU Chico, UC Agricultural and Natural Resources is going to be doing some outreach for us. We've also got the Sierra Business Council, California Co Conservation Corps, and CAL FIRE lined up as partners. So these are the organizations that are going to be doing that on the ground community-based work to get, get us to the place where we can get more forest treated. Uh, just a little bit of background on the proposal, which I think is really important about kind of where we are now. Um, typically, when you're putting together a tw $20 million grant proposal, multi-partner, um, gigantic, all kinds of hurdles to, to go through to get there. It's a very onerous, difficult, and often by the end, angry process in a lot of cases. That was not at all the case in, the, in, in how this proposal went together. Um, there was so much alignment and like just, people were ready to get onto this project. And it was a very fast moving short period of time to make this happen. But it really, I, I think that because the proposal speaks directly to helping California communities in the face of devastating wildfires and economic decline, it just really came together. And I think that was really visible, in fact, to the program administrators. And the conversations we've had with the program administrators in DC, they've talked about how this project was kind of special in the way that it linked these workforce development opportunities with this real community impact for places that need it. So the, the approach is really just kind of coming together. As I said, we've had the grant for all of three weeks now. So we're mostly working on contracts and really fun details that aren't the fun part of the work. Uh, but our, our basic approach is going to be scaling existing training and placement programs at, that are located at these colleges. And then here in the central, uh, at the foundation, we're gonna be doing a lot of coordination among those partners to make sure that resources are aligned, that information is getting shared. And if there are any ways we can get flows of information or even students uh, across those things to make things more efficient, we'll be there for that. And then finally, we're, we're looking to elevate the hub's equity imperative to make sure that, that that's aligned with, with the um, EDA's initiatives as well. So we've got two big kind of blocks of work that we are moving forward with. One is just that convening and information sharing step. A lot of that's going to be like within the partners themselves. So we have a bunch of multi-day partner meetings lined up. Um, we also are just about to launch an industry outreach initiative where we actually go and talk to employers, as many employers as we can, because we want to make sure that these Upscale, this upscaling we're doing is actually going to be responding to the employee, the, the skill needs they see right now, uh, because things are evolving so quickly in that that domain. Um, there's also going to be some public face, more public facing uh, con convenings that are going on, going on. I'll, there's a statewide workforce development summit coming up that I'll talk about in a minute, and we're also hoping also going to have some seminars and discussion series as well. Uh, and then on the ground implementation of our, our, our program, uh, we're just going to be getting resources to the colleges so that they can scale their programs. Uh, and then we're also going to be looking at the kinds of communications, recruitment, and employment services we can provide to both make people aware that these kinds of careers exist, give them reasons why they ought to be interested in them, and then make sure that they can see a pathway towards them that would be beneficial to them. Along the way, we're looking at the kinds of wraparound supports that we can make that could help that people get through that pipeline without falling out. Um, as Jessica just said, housing is one of those ones that we're, everybody is really grappling with, including our colleges. Uh, some many of the uh, the programs they have for uh, forestry are already you know booked. 
fully booked, but to the extent that we want to expand those those outward, like is there capacity in that community to, community to house more people? These are these are these are big challenges. And another portion of the grant uh, is to deepen relationships with Native American communities in the project area, and because each of our partners on the ground already have relationships that are built interacting with their forestry uh, groups, and this is going to be a way to, to, to deepen and expand that. Uh, so finally, I just want to put in a plug for our upcoming uh, Forestry Workforce Summit. That's going to be January 31st and February 1st at Davis, uh, in Davis at the UC Davis uh, Conference Center. This is actually going to be part two of a Workforce Summit series. Carly, who you're, who you're about to hear from, was the mover and shaker behind the first iteration of this, which happened earlier this year. Um, it was a relatively small conference because of space constraints, I think about 80 participants. But as a participant, I can tell you the energy in that room to bring people from educational institutions, uh, industry, and uh, agencies, like all trying to just pool resources and ideas together to get us to the point where we can be treating more acres of forest. It, it was just incredible energy. Um, people couldn't stop talking to each other. And so we all just decided it makes sense to do this again. We're doing it at a place that will have a little more capacity for bringing in more people. And we'll probably give it a, a little bit broader statewide perspective. And it's really gonna be focused on workforce bottlenecks and opportunities to bust through those bottlenecks. And so we're hoping for all kinds of great participation. So this is a program in development, and it's, it's all happening kind of right now in the next couple of months. So if this is resonating with you and you have, think you might have something to contribute, contact me, and um, I, I'd, I'd love to talk. So that's the main overview. As I said, we're just getting started, and um, we're still just really excited about the whole thing. And I, I, I hope that, uh, that within this crowd that's here today, there, there are follow-up follow-ups that could, that can happen that to help us do a better job of, of, of implementing this project. Awesome. Thank you so much for that overview, Jeffrey. Um, it's great to see the collaboration that you guys are facilitating. And um, of course, exciting to see Lake Tahoe Community College specifically included um, as our, our local community college here. So um, without further delay, let's just hand it over to Carly, to tell us a little bit more about Lake Tahoe Community College's program. It's a very exciting program that um, TTCF uh, actually provided some funding for equipment scholarships towards, and I'll let Carly take it away. Yes, thank you, Nicole. And as I've been listening to both of these presentations, wow, you really... Uh lined us up perfectly here. <laughs> uh, I have, uh, our program is a recipient of uh, two state grants to fund the initial development of our program. And uh, moving forward, it will be uh, supported by this good jobs challenge. So it's, um, it's exciting to see all those efforts um, coming to fruition at a program. So um, I'll back up. Uh, again, there's a lot of excitement in here I, about, you know, just in this space. I share that excitement. I get ahead of myself, so bear with me. Um, but I am Carly. I'm the forestry education grant manager at Lake Tahoe Community College, and I have been tasked with creating a brand new forestry program that is launching just uh, next week, really. So we are, we're here, we're ready, and it's very exciting. Um, I did want to point out, and um, both Jeffrey and Jessica, uh, teed this up really well. I am uh, one representative, one program, but there are so many other programs throughout the state. And I really encourage you to find these other programs and learn about what they're offering. Every program is offering something slightly different, has a different focus. Um, and so I just want, I want to make sure you know that um, I am one exciting program of many, and there's a lot of really, really fantastic work happening throughout the state. So I encourage you to do some research and find the other programs. Um, so I am going to uh, briefly touch on two of our programs because they really go hand in hand. So first I want to uh, briefly touch on our Fire Academy and then I'll talk about our forestry program that's launching. So we have had a um, 16 graduated classes of our Fire Academy. And uh, so lots of Fire Academy cadets coming out of Lake Tahoe here. Uh, usually we have about 30 students or so in those co cohorts and an 84% placement rate into positions. So these students really, or these cadets rather, are really ending up in positions immediately. 
And so I wanted to preface it with the fire academy because although we know like, um, you know, structure protection and wildland firefighting is different than forestry, oftentimes people are swapping between these two career paths and there's a lot of overlap at the same time. And so we're not necessarily new to this like fire space but we are new to forestry. Um, and so our forestry program is launching right now, like I said, um, it was originally funded by CAL FIRE and the California Tahoe Conservancy. So both um, state entities that um, Jessica was mentioning the funding from. So we were very appreciative of that, or that um, initial funding. And then our the program itself is going to be comprised of um, three things. So there's an employable skill certificate, which then will fold into a certificate of achievement. And then both of those fold into an associate of science degree. And so if a student ends with the associate of science degree, they will have both of those certificates and then um, transfer opportunities to four year programs from there. Our program, like I said, many of the programs have kind of a key focus. Our focus is more on forest restoration and public land management rather than um, private forestry um, and like heavy equipment log logging operations. Um, and our program also is really trying to, as Jessica was describing earlier, um, be a pipeline to get people on track to become registered professional foresters. Uh, this is something we see a lot of registered for professional foresters retiring right now. And so um, there's large efforts to get people started on that track early. And so our program is really hoping to do that. Currently, uh, we are so thrilled that we have 34 students enrolled in our uh, in our course that's happening uh, just in a week, and that is our capacity. We were we could not believe the response. We have we didn't even really have time to advertise, and so these students have been waiting in our community. Um, some of them are conservation corps members in the forestry corps that was off mentioned earlier. Others are mid career wanting a career change. Some are fresh out of high school. We really have a good mix. And it's exciting to see that people are naturally kind of moving toward forestry without us even having to work that hard to get them into our program. Um, and so we have 34 students and we currently have 15 students on our wait list, which is a really exciting opportunity for us to um, consider expanding our program almost immediately. So we're already going to be offering more sections of our program um, this year to accommodate those students who aren't going to make it into the first um, course. But really our goal is to essentially double our, co our offerings uh, within the next year or two. So we're really responding to it. The college is on board with um, offering these courses as many times as we, as we need to because um, it's just exciting to see so many students. Our college is so small and we never see turnout like this in programs ever. So a um, lot of great momentum and we're really excited about it. And so um, just taking a step back, uh, I think sometimes there, there can be a little bit of a stigma around community colleges. I think that a lot of really great work is happening to break down those barriers. But um, I just want to say it is a great time to be a community college student, specifically in these programs right now. So through these um, generous grants through the Tahoe Chucky Community Foundation and the Forest Futures Program, and then also the Tahoe Fund recently, we are helping to remove cost of attendance for students in both our fire academy and our forestry programs. So in our forestry program, students are every student in the program is receiving $1,000 just for being in the program, no strings attached, just here's $1,000 for starting your, starting your education uh, in forestry. And then Fire Academy, similarly, um, about $1,000 per student for uh, to offset their heavy equipment or their equipment costs and their supplies. They often have to be buying uniforms and purchasing things that come right out of a student's pocket and make it, uh, it can make it not equitable for students. And uh, so we're really excited to have so much support for students specifically um, moving forward. And then our students also have the ability to access a college promise program, which uh, means if they're a first time student and they're full time, they can access, they can have all their tuition covered for the first three years that they're in these programs, which is usually the entire time they're at a community college. So uh, essentially free tuition. All your books are covered through all of our programs and you get a thousand dollars on top of it. I don't, I don't know. It seems like a good deal to me. Sounds great. And you get a job at the end. I, I don't know. I wish I could be a community college student right now. It sounds pretty great. 
Um, and then in addition to all of that, we did, um, as Jeffrey described, we were also uh, a recipient of the Good Jobs Challenge funding. We're getting about, I think, $1.2 million that will allow us to um, really help with staffing so we can meet this demand of, okay, we're ready to double our cohorts. Let's, let's get our staff lined up so that we can support students and that we can continue building these programs. It's also going to help us purchase really important equipment uh, so that students can train on and see and use what they will be using in the field. And then also more student support. So more textbooks. So no students have to buy textbooks in our programs. Um, and more scholarships, things of that nature. So uh, we're really excited about all of that funding. And then we also, uh, speaking of barriers, uh, we recently received funding to construct a 100-bed housing unit on our uh, campus. So we are going to be able to house 100 students starting, I believe, in a couple of years. I think they're breaking ground next summer. Um, and these are specifically for low-income students, and it's going to cost in the double occupancy rooms, $500 per uh, student, so per month. So um, that seems pretty affordable for living in Tahoe. This is really just helping to break down some of those barriers for our students. And we're really excited that that worked out. Um, so we do have a few hurdles. I know that this is the whole focus is opportunities and kind of the struggles uh, on that side as well, challenges. Um, and so one of our biggest challenges that we're facing at our college is we're pretty small. And as uh, Jeffrey was describing earlier, yeah, where do you house people? Where are they coming from? You can keep building your programs, but um, you need to be able to support all those people who are coming. And one of the biggest issues that we are having at our college is around storage. Basic thing, right? But uh, we cannot uh, bring on more students and equip every student with what they need to be in a fire academy or forestry without more storage. And so um, we have these goals of doubling, but we can't do it unless we have more. So one of our biggest um, plans right now is to construct a public safety training center, which would be on campus. This has been in the works for a very long time, the plans for this. Um, full architecture plans are done, engineering's done, everything's done. We are just still um, waiting for the last pieces of funding to come together. We've been waiting for, uh, for the last two years, we've been working on um, some bonds and none of that has been realized, but we're hoping for a direct uh, appropriation, uh, hopefully next year, fingers crossed. But um, again, like I said, this is going to allow us to double or even triple our enrollments in our programs because we'll be able to um, safely store things like, I mean, we have things as large as fire engines all the way in like training apparatus, all the way down to a compass and a GPS unit. So we have small instruments and we have really large pieces of equipment and we need to be able to safely store those um, in order to increase our enrollments. Uh, and then opportunities, again, there's so much momentum in this space and I feel really grateful to be part of it. And um, I'm so excited for our students who are coming. Our, um, we're confident that our public safety training center is going to be realized, which is going to increase our cohorts. We we feel really good about it. We hope it happens soon. Um, and really, uh, we're so proud of how this program has come together in the, um, in the input and engagement of our local employers, local, state, and federal employers. They are all anxiously waiting for students to start so they can begin uh, hiring them. I am just like thrilled with their support for uh, creating our curriculum. They've worked with us on every step of the way of like making sure that these students are their ideal, perfect candidates. So they are employable immediately. They have the skills, they have the education, they have everything they need to be successful. And so with that, um, you know, we're just really excited to continue building our uh, forestry and fire academy to meet this forestry workforce crisis we're in. And I uh, just wanted to send my appreciation to any partners or funders on the call who are helping our students follow their dreams and into these fantastic careers. So I'm excited to continue the conversation and look forward to chatting some more. Thank you. Thanks so much, Carly. Um, this is a super exciting time, I agree. I think to be a, a, interested in community college um, education as, as you and Jeffrey and Jessica all described through all these programs and especially in the forestry sector. And so hopefully, 
We'll continue to see those increases in enrollment numbers um, and whatnot in your program and in the other programs across the state. Um, so with that, we did have some questions come in and we have some kind of preloaded questions as well. Um, I am going, I think um, Jessica is with us still on the phone, I believe. Can you confirm that, Jessica? Well, we'll get started with questions. Um, I think she was trying to be on the phone with us, but she did have another commitment. Um, so uh, let's see, I'm gonna go first to um, Jan Mays had two questions. So Jan, if you wanna unmute yourself and go ahead with your first one and, and then your second one afterwards. Thank you. Um, I had a question related to the biomass facilities. There seem to be a lot of them that have been planned for a long time. And I know that transportation of biofuels for biomass has been a big obstacle. Is that the only thing that needs to be done or what's holding these facilities from, you know, getting through the planning stages and, and being operational? I think this might be a question suited for Jessica. So we'll see if she is able to hop on. And if not, I can give it a little bit of a shot if you guys, unless Jeffrey or Carly, you want to. <laughs> okay, um, I think we might have lost Jessica. I know she was trying to stay on the phone with us, but um, I guess what I can tell you, Jan, just, just briefly, is that I think that there's multiple obstacles to um, getting these biomass facilities off the ground. Some of it is related to policy change that is just starting to happen. Um, some of it is related to workforce. I, I think we could say as well of just like having people being trained to build and work the facilities. Um, and then policy around um, environmental regulations, which for a long time held back the development of biomass facilities um, that we're starting to see change. So I think it's a wide variety of, of issues um, that are impacting <laughs> the development of these biomass facilities, but there is more movement there. I think as Jessica mentioned, there's more funding coming from the state level. Um, so I think we'll see more, more progress in that area. Um, and if you wanna ask your next question, we can move into that one. Sure, and thank you for that. Uh, the next question is for the two other presenters. Um, I live in Nevada County and we have Sierra College, which is not one of the five that are partnering. So my question is simply, how can other community colleges that are not direct partners benefit from this program? That's a great question. And it's one we're actually working on now. Uh, so the, the contours of the actual submission that, that had to go into the EDA was that you had to identify the partners and the budget line items associated with them at that moment of submission. And just inevitably in that situation, you're not going to be able to find, identify and bring in every potential, every potential partner. That said, we are already like kind of coming up with policies and governance structures to make sure that all of our information sharing and just things we come up with that are useful across the board are that, that, that those those partners can be a part of that. I would also say that we're really, I mean, right now, just the general landscape of particularly California is one of relative resource abundance. And so we don't, you know, we don't think we're done with this work forestry workforce development thing by having gotten one grant. I mean, we, for um, colleges and other in entities that have ideas for how we can fill in gaps that are kind of left behind with this, this existing program. We're all about putting together new partnerships and pursuing the, 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 these resources that are floating out around Sacramento right now. Absolutely. That's a and this is Jessica. Can you guys hear me now? Yes, go ahead, Jessica. Ah, perfect. Sorry, I could hear you guys. Um, uh, and I and Nicole, just to answer the biomass question, I thought you, Nicole actually did a beautiful job on it. So the only thing I really want to add um, is is that um, is that it's really important to have um, that we're we're trying to get a diversity of technology, right? It's about the right technology at the right location um, and the right scale. And so um, and so I, I often hear people sort of use biomass to energy as like a panacea. And it's just one technology in a suite of technologies. And so when you're looking at sort of, well, what do we want to build for new facilities? Um, you know, there's maybe a next generation of technology that we can also focus on as well. 
that pencils out better, such as like biomass facilities. Um, one of the first steps they actually make, they convert that um, uh, biofuel into liquid natural gas. And so if you could instead use it as liquid natural gas, the economy pencils out on it better um, and the technology is already there. And so, you know, I think there's some thinking in that space that's needed for like, if you're going to start from ground zero and build something new. Um, and then there's other thinking for like, well, what do you do with the technology that exists, such as biomass to energy? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jessica. Um, so I'm going to go to a question that John Radable uh, asked, and I think it, it might be more specific kind of locally um, and actually something that Forest Futures could help with. Um, but go ahead and ask for your question, John. I'll see if the speakers want to address it. Otherwise, I can touch on it briefly as well. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I was just curious, you know, as a town, if we got together, who might we approach about asking about a strategic fuel break uh, here in King's Beach, north of town, this all national forest. And, and we talked about it before, it could just come racing down and maybe if there was a break, it could help. But who would we approach for that? I mean, uh, my recommendation would be to talk with your uh, local fire protection district first. Uh, yeah, in your cool. case, it would be North Tahoe Fire. Um, yeah. And I would, I would start with them because they might know uh, planning efforts that are, you know, that might be underway in the future. Uh, and if not, they would likely be able to connect you with the appropriate folks that if it's um, for service land, they'd be able to connect you with the appropriate people. So I would start with um, North Tahoe Fire for that. Okay, thanks. Okay, I'm going to go to... Um, kind of a comment that spurs a question that was put in the chat for you guys um, about outreach to potential students. Um, and, and the comment is about, you know, really putting these opportunities out there. And, and just curious, I guess the question I'm turning it into is, can you all speak to what the outreach efforts are um, for these new programs and new opportunities, you know, from the state level all the way down to the local LTCC program and how, you know, you guys saw a really positive response in this first year having a wait list already. But um, one, you know, ho hopefully there's still an outreach plan to engage more people um, in, in, especially in the other programs um, and new programs to come. So can you touch on your outreach plans? Let me just touch on the state quickly and then hand it over to the pros in the field. Um, so, you know, I can just give you a couple high level examples, but each of our programs is going to have a different strategy here. Um, but for example, the Natural Resources Agency now has kind of walk in office hours for um, for new recruits, um, which is kind of exciting for uh, state human resources, which is unusual. Um, the CCC has gotten, the, the California Conservation Corps has gotten very creative in their outreach. So they both do sort of more traditional things like going to high schools and, and uh, recruiting kids at a high school. But they also, I was talking to some CCC members who were recruited via TikTok. Um, and they were like, oh, I saw it on TikTok. And so I joined, <laughs> which was amazing. Um, and so, um, but then also the outreach at community colleges, um, that career pathways piece is really um, crucial. With the Conservation Corps, we've created a career navigator program so that when they're finishing up their year of service, they're transitioning in. And then the other piece that I think might be worth talking about in more depth later um, is that we have a training reentry program for um, for formerly incarcerated individuals who went through the fire crew, um, and they go into this uh, reentry program, which is very structured. And that's been an interesting, uh, it was an anti-recidivism program at its core, um, but it also has been a really interesting way to um, recruit people into then careers at Cal Fire and others. Yeah, I'll go next. And my, my answer is a little less developed because as I said, we're just getting started. There is fortunately a very significant um, allocation within this budget to outreach and communications and figuring out how best to reach people to bring them into the program. One of the goals of the EDA and the, 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 the US Department of Commerce is to benefit local communities. So I do think our first order engagement will try to be within the Northern Sierra and the Cascades regions, which, which tend to be 
economically challenged in many ways to start with. So to the extent that we can reach people from within the communities, that, that and plus they're already housed within the communities, that, that's a great pathway forward. But we're not, we're not stopping there. I think there's a lot of opportunity to look beyond that. But uh, we are we are going to be working. We are also working with CCC again, latching onto some of their great ideas. We use student ambassadors on campus to get people who are signing up to be students to, to consider these as as pr prospective careers. And then we're also looking at some of those kind of creative supports, um, even things like what we call it our, our career catalyst program, which at, at, in some cases actually we, we can serve as an employer of record to get students in that transitional phase from um, student to their, their fully final em employed state. Uh, if that's if that ends up being, being a barrier in some settings. So it can help draw people in the pipelines knowing there's something kind of set up at the end. Yeah, uh, I would echo that, Jeffrey. We're also in our individual program looking at how we um, really advertise like what positions these students will be qualified for if they get each certificate or degree. I don't think we've done um, just across the board on uh, programs throughout the state. I don't think we've done a great job of like just like celebrating and showcasing how broad of a field forestry is. And so I think that it's going to be really important, this work with the Good Jobs Challenge specifically, since we're all coming together across the state. It, I think it provides a really great opportunity to, as I see Lucy's comment in here about like doing some research right now, it's rough to figure out where are the forestry programs, how do they differ, so I really envision like this work that we're collectively doing with the foundation resulting in like, maybe we have a great like web page that has all the programs and the kind of special um, specialty of each program. And like, what will you gain if you exit that program and career opportunities and stuff. So I really hope that we can end with something like that. And then also I know as part of Good Jobs, there was a bigger plan of like marketing just like forestry like we just need to market this like forestry is a career and it's a path and I know there's other efforts throughout the state on that with different groups too and so I think it's um, all of us are going to be doing our individualized uh, marketing of our programs but I think there's a really great opportunity for um, larger advertising across the state that shows that we're all working together we want we just want people to go to these programs or not just end up in forestry careers is really what we want so um, yeah, Jeffrey, looks like you have yeah. something to add. So I would say it's not quite the same thing, but I think it's related. Another one of the things we're, we're trying to, in the, our communication convening portion of this, this grant is really also engage on that, you know, that kind of credentialism aspect of a lot of this. Like, what are, what do employers really need in order to, like, to, to, to be matched up with future employees that are, that can do the jobs they need done? And, you know, I think there can be at times some kind of, policy or um, policy barriers to that, especially in, you know, some government agencies, you know, there, there are histories of what's expected for somebody to enter in a certain career. So I, I think the, the time really is ripe as well to be having those conversations at a number of different levels, federal and state and local, to make sure that we, we don't have artificial barriers to people who can do work, um, but that would kind of be cut off for it just based on some kind of credential requirement that may or may not be appropriate. So it's, it's another part of the moving, but one more moving piece. But again, people are talking about these kinds of things right now. Awesome. Thank you guys for addressing that. Um, we did just get another question in from Eric um, at Truckee Fire. And I was going to ask one that's kind of similar. So I think I'll maybe throw mine in. And then Eric, you want to unmute and, and ask yours because they kind of can be answered together, I think. But I was... Building off the outreach side, I was going to ask um, if there's plans to engage with high school students, you know, before they're graduating um, to, to make them aware of these programs and opportunities. And then I think, Eric, go ahead and, and add yours in as well. Yeah, great. Thanks, Nicole. I'm Eric Hornvet, Wildfire Prevention Manager with Truckee Fire. So yeah, I'll just read it. You know, really interested in, you know, how a local fire district, you know, especially with some local tax funding and partnerships and an expanding, you know, wildfire prevention and mitigation division, how do we interact closely with these new workforce development programs and colleges? 
I mean, just some quick ideas is that, you know, it'd be great for us to participate, whether it's, you know, coming in and speaking at high school or college events or, you know, job placement type things, um, showing these jobs are attractive and, and cool and ready to jump into um, a lot of our project work, rather than, whether it's prevention, whether it's mitigation, um, it's great stuff to get any of these new students out on, right? They can kind of get the informational, educational field trips um, and even some opportunities for entry level jobs during their education process and then help facilitate that job placement post-graduation. Um, I know I went to UNR's Forest Management and Ecology Program, and uh, I worked on an on-call fire crew for the Plumas National Forest um, from, you know, basically that June, July, August, September, June, July, August, that short little three-month window between semesters and got, you know, multiple seasons of wildland fire exposure, even while I was in college. Um, and it really helped set me up for success and it was really the field trips that I ended up on looking at, you know, project work that was going on in Tahoe Donner, Truckee, um, some of the Nevada Division of Forestry projects going on at Lake Tahoe. That's what really got me hooked in the career, um, coupled with that fire experience during college. I think it really set me up for success um, jumping into to a position now. So I think I, I have an on the ground level of experience and would love to hear how we can share my experience and interact with these programs. Yeah, I'm happy to uh, start. You you mentioned just at the very end a really great point around like you work three months out of the season and they, uh, you know, that's kind of every, we need employees, but asking employers to hire students for only a couple of months, we realized is a barrier all in itself. And so with our program, we have um, extended, we're on the academic quarter system, so it makes it a little easier to do this. But our courses don't start until um, mid-October and then uh, in the fall. And so it's a shortened uh, fall quarter. And then in the spring, we end early in spring as well for all of our forestry courses. Really, the idea there was like employers are going to need more than like two or three months. And we didn't feel like we were meeting our um, employers where they were asking us to meet them. Uh, if we didn't do that. And so I feel really excited about being able to pull that off, at least at my local community college. Um, and then to answer the question about high school students in particular, um, this has been something that um, I've certainly been grappling with a lot is how we engage high school students um, through dual enrollment programs specifically. Our college will hopefully have a dual enrollment course so like they can do their introduction to forestry course in high school and receive high school and college credit which really helps them see a pathway in but there's also um, a program throughout the state the forestry challenge which I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, which is doing fantastic work with high school students in getting them exposure to forestry and teaching them some forestry skills and we are um, partnering with the Forestry Challenge to offer all of those students who take part in the Forestry Challenge credit. So they'll receive some uh, college credit. It won't be significant. It'll be like one or two units, but it's going to get their foot in the door and let them see, hey, I can do college. I can do this. I can see that there's a path and I can see Lake Tahoe Community College is one of those paths. Uh, but certainly the Forestry Challenge is going to be offering and showing other programs as well. But I think supporting that program in particular is going to be really helpful because they're already working with for, with students in high schools throughout the state. So expanding that I think could be really good. Um, and then just a quick note on job placements. So on a local level, um, I have really close uh, just partnerships with our employers. So they, as I mentioned, essentially created our program from the ground up. But um, a large piece of our program and what our funding from CAL FIRE and the California Tahoe Conservancy includes is this job placement component. And so really specifically thinking through how we can help place students into positions. And so I um, am working with local, state, and federal entities. So Eric will definitely be uh, coming and knocking on your door, I'm sure, here soon to make sure that we have all those partnerships. We know when the position's open so that we can help students get through their applications, hoping to host like USA Jobs and Cal HR, whatever their site is, uh, workshops with students and really just making sure that all of those barriers are removed so they can just like get into positions like efficiently and quickly. And we have um, employers coming into classrooms and meeting students and all of that. So at least on a local level, I um, 
I feel really excited about the job placement and recruitment piece of this. Um, and I know that other community colleges throughout the state, um, Shasta comes to mind in particular, they're working really close with their, with their partners as well, um, their employer partners to realize that. Did you wanna add anything, Jeffrey? Or Jessica? <laughs> No, I was just going to say, we're, we're honestly, we're going to be listening to the partners on the ground, come up, sharing these ideas and help help spread good ideas across the, the, the Northern Sierra and Cascades. That's our idea. Yeah, I think they've covered it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, I'm going to go to a question that um, I kind of had had waiting or that came up when Jessica was speaking about the state level um, small business development um, is, you know, obviously a huge part of, of expanding and supporting our the forestry workforce needs. So when you mentioned um, that there would be small business support through, I think maybe the, I think the good jobs challenge might include some of that too, correct me if I'm wrong, but definitely from the state level. Um, what does that specifically include? Are we, are we talking about just financial support or potentially technical assistance, partnerships, um, you know, entrepreneurial mentoring, that kind of thing? Would that be a part of small business support? Um, really great question, Nicole. I mean, it's essentially at the, from, the, from the sort of macro level of the state here, we have small business development grants, right? So if somebody wanted to get a grant to, um, you know, if they had a small business and they needed a little uh, sort of seed capital for it, um, they could get that if they needed funding to be able to put together that business plan, um, they could do that. This isn't going to be a technical assistance directly from like Cal Fire, right? But, um, but also, I mean, I think there's other parts of the state that do do that, you know, with like GoBiz and others. Um, but, or this could be grants to um, an organization that does, you know, small business development support. So it's a little bit wide open of like, business development grants that could either be to individual businesses or groups that are trying to support businesses in this space. Um, and so those are going to be grants available through Cal Fire. Great, thanks. Um, I know Sierra Business Council is also working in the space of um, forest entrepreneur and Sierra Institute, um, Forest Entrepreneur Workshops and TTCF is, is also considering supporting those efforts. Um, I wasn't sure if there was anything included in the good jobs challenge in that area as well. Yeah, the EDA doesn't allow um, any kind of direct support, support to businesses. So we're actually tr still trying to figure out what, you know, to what extent that, what that means, but in theory, no, for not for this, this iteration. Great. Um, does anyone have any other questions from the audience that haven't been typed in or addressed yet? Otherwise, I think I'm gonna hand it Unmute yourself now and ask. Otherwise, I'm going to hand it back to Kate to wrap us up. I got one more. Okay. <laughs> cool. Um, so is the state or any of these local colleges looking to create like a forestry workforce, you know, job board that can be used to share career opportunities? And that's probably a big challenge, right? Everyone's always looking for the needle in the haystack. Um, and a lot of the kind of standard ways that uh, we meet requirements for posting jobs doesn't necessarily get it in the hands of the most qualified people. I'll, I'll speak to that because that is one of our goals with the Good Jobs Challenge because we know, again, showing showing the, the, how the pipeline can work to someone who's maybe thinking about doing it and, and then knowing that when you get to the end, you're going to have access to that full range of uh, open jobs would be really, really valuable. You can imagine the technical challenges that that represents. So, you know, we, we're definitely going to be exploring that and figuring out what the best that could be done would look like. I mean, that, that that's a goal. Absolutely. Awesome. Great, thank you. Well, I will jump in then and wrap us up. And I just wanted to say thank you to Jessica, to Jeffrey, to Carly for all of the time and for everything that you're doing. Uh, we are really grateful that you spent some of your day with us. And thank you to everyone who joined us this evening to, to hear from our speakers. Thank you for taking the time to join us. We're going to have a feedback survey uh, in the chat. And you can receive an email in the next day or so with a recording of tonight's discussion, which will also be on um, the TTCF website and our YouTube channel. Um, I hope that you will choose to learn more about Forest Futures uh, by going to our website, by being in touch with Nicole or myself or any member of the TTCF staff. 
Um, reach out directly. We'd love to hear from you. Perhaps consider supporting these efforts with your end of year philanthropy um, as we're getting to that time. So if you're so inclined, you know, the, uh, as you heard, all of these projects take funding and T TCF and Forest Futures um, is really happy to be able to uh, deploy those funds where they are most strategic. So we invite you to join us uh, again on October 19th for our next salon. We are working on securing the speakers and the topic, which we will announce shortly. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your interest. Uh, thank you for everything you're doing. And we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Have a good night.